on the freezing winter night in 1816, as the icy winds blew, a mysterious figure walks through the doors of a tavern. The dimly lit room he enters was adorned with influential figures from across the country. From John Randolph, the fiery congressman from Virginia, Robert Wright, the steadfast representative of Maryland, the esteemed Senator Daniel Webster, and the illustrious representatives of the Riviere Lee family were all seated at a table. As whispers hush and hikes visit, the emphatic man approaches their table, his very presence sparking both curiosity and anticipation, and then a surprising twist unfolds. As he boldly ascends their table, the room holds his breath, awaiting the words that will set in motion the untold motives and secrets concealed in the shadows of this assembly. Can there be a nobler cause than that which whilst it proposes to rid our country of a useless and pernicious, if not dangerous, portion of its population that contemplates the spreading of the arts of civilized life and the possible redemption from ignorance and barbarism of a benighted quarter of the globe? And that is how the American Colonization Society was born, a men only club, as this was 1800s America. A war for independence had been fought, women could not vote, and the fastest growing demographic in the country was free black people. The American War for Independence is a well known story, from the Boston Tea Party and all that good stuff, or bad stuff if you are the British. But what is often overlooked is that free and enslaved Africans fought in this war under the declaration that all men are created equal. This then raises the question of whether denying life liberty and the pursuit of happiness to enslaved people could coexist with such a declaration. The United States will eventually face this question amongst other things with a civil war, but for now the American Colonization Society proposed the solution. Colonization. They believed that African Americans would be better off in their homelands and that colonization was a way to ensure that they could achieve their own potential. With this argument, they were able to secure a grossly insufficient sum of $100,000 from Congress. The next step on the ACS plans was to convince African Americans to get on a boat to be shipped across the Pacific to a land where they have never been before. Yeah, this sounds like a great idea. They approached the All Black Bethel Church in Philadelphia, looking for willing volunteers, where they were met with a resounding NO! The ACS had to go back to the drawing board to rebrand their plans as a mission to spread the gospel to Africa, to appeal to the more receptive factions within the church. People like Daniel Coca, a biracial clergyman who had experienced discrimination from both the white and black community, aligned themselves with the ACS. With their help, they were able to convince about 82 people to become colonists, but most really joined because they sought to exercise the right to self-determination. After all, they were Americans. Even though they had not fully experienced the rights and freedoms the white compatriots enjoyed, they recognized the values of these freedoms and sought to secure them in a new home. On the 31st day of January 1820, nearly 200 years after the Mayflower brought the first set of European colonists to the New World, the ship Elizabeth embarked on a journey. With crowds gathered to witness its departure from New York, many filled with sorrow knowing they will never see their families and friends again. The ship's destination? The windward coast of West Africa. As the ship sailed further and further away from the familiar shores of America, the excitement slowly gave way to a growing sense of unease. The reality of the journey that they embarked on slowly began to sink in. But then they noticed they were not alone. The ACS had sent TV agents with them, but the colonists could care less. As far as they were concerned, they were going to establish a new republic that would be ruled by people just like them. They drew up a compact, pledging commitment to serve God in their new country and also to establish a civil government. But the ACS never had any plans for the colonies to govern themselves, as they believed they were not ready for any meaningful form of self-government, giving absolute dictatorial powers to the ACS agents. When the colonists found out, and heavy mutinous spirit could be felt on board, the tension was palpable, as the colonists realized that the dreams for self-rule and determination was quickly becoming a nightmare. Months before the Elizabeth departed, this year's has sent agents to West Africa on a fact-finding mission. During this expedition, they met a fascinating man named John Kessel, a native of Shebra Highland. He managed to impress them and convince them that Shebra would be an ideal location to establish their colony. 
John showed them the vast expanse of savanna and forest and confidently assured them that he could negotiate with native chiefs to facilitate the sales of these lands to arriving colonists. Elizabeth will arrive at the port of Freetown, Sierra Leone on March 9, 1820, replenishing his supplies and heading straight for Shebra. When they arrived at their destination, they were greeted by Kessel, who had arranged a grand welcoming party, complete with singing and dancing. Our colonists were able to set up camp at Kessel's trading post Capelle, with the ACS agents negotiating for lands in the interior, but the contact was unable to arrange the necessary meetings to acquire the lands as promised. It turned out that these lands were not for sale, and that Kessel lacked the authority to make just promises or arrangements. The colonists were in big trouble, as Capelle was an horrible place to be. It was swampy, infested mosquitoes, and had no portable water. As time passed, the living condition of the colony had deteriorated to a deplorable state. Things were so bad that those who still had strength had to petition to be relocated to a more favorable location. But their demands fell on deaf ears, as they were instead blamed for complaining too much. But in reality, ACS was grossly underprepared and overconfident. By the 8th of April, 35 colonists had died to the seasoning fever. But things will really get worse from here. The two remaining ACS agents would pass away months apart, leaving Daniel Coker, who was in charge, with no choice but to flee to Freetown, following an uprising in the struggling economy. The first attempt of American colonization in Africa was a complete failure. When the news of the ACS disaster which had unfolded in Africa reached the US Congress, there was a sense of bruised imperial pride. Again, the US Congress funded the ACS colonial effort this time sending a federal agent to make sure that the job gets done. In November of the following year, Robert F. Stockton, a federal agent of the US government, Ares, the new ACS agent, and 13 new colonists arrived in Sierra Leone to pick up the remaining surviving colonists. Knowing Shebra was an hellscape, they headed for Cape Mosserado, where they immediately began to negotiate with the local day chief, who agreed to set up a meeting with the day king to sell land to the colonists. But things were turning out to be just like Shebra, as the day chief did not meet his end of the bargain. But unlike the former ACS agents before him, Stockholm was different. He, along with Ares and some colonists, marched to the village of the day chief. Not willing to be made a fool like the previous agents that came before him, Stockholm drew his pistol at the day king. Fearing for the life of the king, the day chief begged for another chance to make things right. It took nearly a month of negotiation, but on the 15th of December 1820, for the cost of three casts of tobacco, five casts of beef, one barrel of rum, six muskets, 12 guns, and three barrels of gunpowder, a 40-mile stretch of Cape Monserrado became the property of the ACS colony. But just like the Nenapi people, who sold the highland of Manhattan to the Dutch for $24, the day people had no concept of land ownership, and as such, the day wanted the lands back. The colonists quickly had to take possession of their newly acquired home. They began falling trees and carrying stones, clearing space for their new city on the Cape. But after a week of hard and intense work, they only really had one hut to throw for it. They needed help. They needed native help. But no matter how much they offered to pay the natives, they refused to render their services. Ares would eventually return to the US, leaving the colonists to build out the first settlement, facing the rains and the seasoning sickness that came with it. It had been a year since our colonists, now settlers, had acquired the Cape of Mozarado and established a small settlement called Pistentopolis to overlook the Cape, but the frosty relationship with the natives persisted and would eventually get worse. On the 10th of November 1820, the first of many conflicts between the settlers and the natives broke out. Hundreds of gay men, armed with muskets and spears, charged at Christopolis. In response, the settlers, determined to defend their home, rushed out and returned fire. This resulted in many of them being killed by day gunfire. The settlers retreated, leaving the day to loot their abandoned houses. But seizing this opportunity, the settlers returned cannon fire, causing the day to panic and retreat into the incoming second wave. Now having the advantage, 
the settlers laid waste to the day, resulting in a bloody and gruesome battlefield. Weeks after the first conflict, a second skirmish erupted between the settlers and the day. Just like the first conflict, neither side was able to gain a clear advantage, but the day were able to inflict significant damage on the settlers' farmland, leaving them more vulnerable than ever before. The British, who magically happened to be around the area, decided to intervene, hoping to keep the situation from escalating any further. It worked, and for the time being, there will be an uneasy peace on the Cape. Two years after the war on the Cape, Ashmom, the new ACS agent, would show up to the colony with the 105 new settlers and a fresh set of orders from the ACS board. <clears throat> he began. The board has decided to give this colony a name, Liberia, which means the land of the free. Its capital, Christopolis, will now be called Monrovia. The board also expresses its concerns that you have grown overly reliant on her good graces, and that the colony needs to be more self-sufficient, particularly regarding food production. With the farmland still recovering from the damage inflicted during the war with the native, the news was met with panic and revolt among some settlers, who stormed the colony's warehouse to loot it. Tensions were high within the colony, as the settlers had become convinced that the ECS agents had embezzled the funds intended for the colony's support. But the reality was the ECS board was broke and could not afford to support them anymore. Congress had cut funding to the ECS board under pressure from abolitionists who saw Liberia as a way to promote slavery. The board looked to cut costs, which led to the situation in the colony. These underlining facts would not matter to the settlers who chased out the ECS agents. The sentiment within the colony was one of resentment and betrayal. They did not sign up to be lauded over by ACS agents. They wanted the board to deal with them directly. Of course, this did not happen, and the ACS agents would return months later with a compromise from the board. They would set the general policy of the colony, and the agents would have ultimate authority. But the daily affairs of the colony would be handled by representatives who were elected by the settlers. This was a step towards something they always wanted, self-government the settlers will finally be able to control their destiny, at least to some degree. Back in the US mainland, the debate over the continued existence of slavery was becoming very polarizing. This rift will ultimately lead to a decline in funding from southern states and donations from northern philanthropists who had a problem with the ACS. With its resources dwindling, the ACS prioritized sending as many manumissioned people as they could to Liberia. And when that became too expensive, a new constitution would be drafted for Liberia's independence. The drafting of Liberia's new constitution was embroiled in many heated debates, with various fractions trying to steer the soon-to-be nation in its own ideals. But one thing they all agreed on, we the people of the Republic of Liberia did not include recaptive slaves, nor the indigenous people of the land that they will now call their country. After the first election, Joseph Jenkins Roberts will be declared the first president of the Republic of Liberia. On the 18th of September 1850, the United States would pass the Fugitive Slave Act, which led to a surge of new settlers to Liberia. Many of them trying to avoid being enslaved under this new law were forced to leave their homes with little or no resources. Upon their arrival to Liberia, they became destitutes, unable to support themselves without aid. The new government of Liberia decided to use these new settlers to establish new colonies, which often got attacked by the natives. Moreover, responded to these clashes with punitive expeditions, which led to the extensive displacements of natives. Many of these displaced natives then had to work as servants to survive. This created an environment that made it difficult for Moreover to collect taxes from the natives. For the next two decades, the whole set of settlers using their position in government to control of all aspects of the country's economy, from shipping to mining and trade, they grew immensely wealthy, developing into a powerful merchant class who now preferred being called honorables, as they lived a life of extreme opulence that they were considered to be more Victorian than the Victorians. Unfortunately for the newer set of settlers and recaptive slaves, life was difficult. As they lived in abject poverty, the government controlled by the honorable elites did little or nothing to improve their situations and only showed concern when their own business interests were in danger. By 1869, 
Edward James Roy, a member of the True Whig Party, was determined to change all this. Roy was a strong advocate of what would evolve into Pan Africanism and argued for the integration and development of the country's interlands. But Roy was considered to be too radical by the Honorables of the Republican Party, who favored a more conservative and pro American approach to governance. Despite this, Roy won the election, but on the same ballot was also a referendum to extend the presidential term limit to four years, the result of which would become extremely important in a few years. The Honorables were strongly opposed to the direction Roy and his advisor Blyden advocated for. They feared an increase in the participation of natives would dilute the powers in both commerce and politics. To them, the natives had to be kept in check, as they greatly outnumbered the settlers 35 to 1. They were not about to watch their hard works be undone by two ideologues who were hell bent on changing the status quo. Something had to be done. Blyden's close friendship with the First Lady would prove to be his undoing as he was accused of having a scandalous affair with her. This false accusation led to him narrowly escaping being lynched to death. Fleeing for his life, he sought refuge in Syria alone. As for President Roy, the Honorables just refused to pay taxes, which made it very difficult for him to fund his large-scale development projects. Growing increasingly frustrated, Roy approached the Senate, seeking approval to borrow funds to finance these projects. But the Senate of course denied this request, leaving Roy with no other option but to take a loan without their approval, which came with the worst loan conditions ever negotiated by the country. So you want a loan for £500,000 for Liberia? Yes. Okay, well you see, how you need some assurances. Three years interest up front, and at 7% interest, also 30% discount for defaulting. That comes up to you owing us. £650,000. Please sign here. The horrible loan condition sparked fierce debates within the Senate, prompting the Republican Party to hold snap elections to remove Roy. Roy countered, agreeing that the referendum held during his election gave him two more years as president. This disagreement led to a mini civil war in Monrova, as the two sides fought for who had the legal right to occupy the presidency. Ultimately, Roy was eventually captured and tried for treason. But a few days into his detention, Roy was broken out of prison. His loyal supporters had a plan for him to flee the country, but fate had other plans, as his lifeless body was dragged out of the ocean. He had drowned while swimming onto a British ship. This unfortunate turn of events brought much condemnation onto the Republican Party, with the brutality exhibited being deemed too barbaric. As a result, the True Whig Party rose to power, dominating Liberian politics for the next 102 years. While Roy and Blyden had failed in their attempt to lead a revolution in the country, the seeds of their ideology was already planted. Towards the end of the 19th century, the golden age of Liberia was coming to an end as technology advanced rapidly. The Honorables, who had been wasteful and deprived the country of much needed taxes to develop, could no longer compete with the newer steamships that moved goods across the Atlantic. They were just faster and better. Liberia became practically broke. The Berlin Conference had changed the rules of colonization. Treaties were no longer sufficient to lay claim to a territory, and occupation was now a necessity. Of course, the British were the first to take a bite out of Liberia, taking away Sherbrooke into Syria alone. The French were up next, greedily taking away a chunk of Liberia's northern territory into New Guinea. Of course, they were not satisfied, as France wanted more, taking away Grebel land into Côte d'Ivoire. The Germans, in not wanting to be left out, also entered the race to gobble up what little was left of Liberia demanding it paid compensation for the damages caused by its natives or submit to German colonization. Fearing the worst, Liberia ran to the US for support and was willing to give up its sovereignty to become a US colony again. But America was occupied in doing America to Spain. As Liberia was besieged from all sides, it got an unlikely ally in the British, who helped ward off the Germans and preferred keeping Liberia as a buffer between it and the French. Before the British could change their mind, Liberia needed to act fast. It didn't have the population to colonize the interlands, nor the money or manpower needed to occupy it. Liberia tried admitting some local chiefs as non-voting delegates in the Senate, an idea that was quickly abandoned. Having no option left, Liberia was forced to play the imperialism game, adopting the tactics of their European adversaries by opting for an indirect rule with the natives, paying chiefs who collaborated with them a hundred dollars annually. With the threat of being swallowed up by its European rivals at bay for now, Liberia needed a friend to solve its money and sovereignty issues. 
The truth was that Liberia needed the US. Despite being shunned the last time it needed its help, Liberia would approach the US again, this time under the presidency of Theodore Roosevelt, arguing passionately for the need for American investment in the country. Roosevelt would agree, but only under the condition that Liberia would submit itself to a fact-finding mission. Booker T. Washington would represent the US government to negotiate the terms of a loan. The loan was intended to help the Liberian government pay off its debt, improve infrastructures, and reorganize and reform the barely functioning Liberian Frontier Force with the aid of the American Buffalo Soldiers. Being isolated and surrounded by the Syrian forces for nearly 100 years had made our settlers now called Americos to develop a deep sense of nationalism and mistrust of the outside world. During World War I, they briefly enjoyed prosperity by selling raw materials to the Central Powers. That's until America decided to enter the war in 1917. This decision left the American elites poorer, as they lost their only source of income. Liberia was desperate for cash, as President Charles King would travel to New York in 1921, intending to check in the wartime high OU of a $5 million loan from the US government, a loan he believed was Liberia's reward for his loyalty during the war. While waiting for his meeting with the White House, President King would meet with a cast of some very colorful people. The first was Marcus Garvey, a Jamaican businessman and activist who founded the Universal Negro Improvement Association to fight the British colonization of the Caribbeans, which did not turn out as he planned. So he moved to New York, where he preached of black capitalism and racial solidarity. He sold shares of his organization to fund the creation of his new city in Africa, where black people from all over the Americas and Europe would return to liberate the continent from European colonists and Liberia was going to be the site of a city on the hill in the African jungle. President King, it's my only intention to see Liberia become a strong, industrialized, and commercially successful nation. He then met with critics of Marcus Garvey within the black community, many of them who believed his intentions were misplaced. Garvey is a fool, a coward, who wants us to give up and go back to Africa. This is our home. And we have a right to be treated well in our home. The last meeting he had was with agents of the BOI, which is now called the FBI. They had always been suspicious of Gavi. They saw a black man who had years of millions and was spewing radical anti-American ideology. Do you support the fight for emancipation of black people from the tyranny of the Jim Crow era? Like most Americans, President King was well aware that Liberia's survival relied on not upsetting the West especially when it came to the matter of Marcus Garvey, where showing solidarity could endanger what he believed Liberia had worked too hard for. Reports from foreign visitors about the widespread mistreatment of native helpers and his subsequent UNIA fact-finding mission only added to Garvey's doubt in trusting the American elites. Garvey planned to work directly with the natives, bypassing the American elites' wealth power in Liberia. The Americans on the part also recognized the economic development Gavi could bring and were willing to work with him as long as he proved useful. Both sides were engaged in a delicate dance of deception. The UNIA was able to secure land from the Monrovian government in 1922 to build their new city in Cape Palmas. In return, they set up a development fund worth £2 million to invest in businesses and projects all over Liberia. Things seemed to be going great for both parties. That's until Gavi started having legal issues with the US government. He was arrested by the BOI for conspiracy and mail fraud. Now, to make matters worse, the development fund meant for Liberia had been embezzled, leaving the organization in a very precarious position. Like all that wasn't enough, the UNI's plans to form their own independent government in the Cape Palmas colony was leaked. The UNI's relationship with Liberia finally collapsed when Gavi's check bounced, and the US shipping board requested the Liberian officials to confiscate all of their goods. At this point, Gavi was no longer useful to the American elites. Ironically, the US Senate voted to deny Liberia the loan it so desperately needed, as some of the American elites would become very, very desperate. The 1927 presidential election wasn't just Liberia's most consequential election, but holds the world record as the most fraudulent election in history. President King, who was seeking re-election, ran against successful businessman and advocate for native rights, 
Thomas J. Frankner. With just 15,000 votes up for grabs, President King, President Charles D.B. King, won his re-election with 96.39% of the votes cast. Now you may say, but Bamishai, an election with 96.39% of the vote doesn't sound that bad. And I will say yes, it doesn't sound that bad, till I tell you that 96.39% represent 249,000 votes. What makes the election result even more absurd is that of the 249,000 votes, which would have been a 1,660% turnout, wasn't a random number, but represented the native populations whose votes were casted on their behalf, despite not being allowed to vote constitutionally. For sure, Faulkner wasn't going to accept the election results, as King was projected to lose. His failure to secure the post-World War I US loan, as well as the Butch Marcos Gavi's UNIA debacle, had made King desperate for investment, so desperate that he approved a deal where 1 million acres of land was going to be leased for 99 years to American businessman Avi Firestone to establish a rubber plantation. Not only was Firestone given a $5 million loan by the US government to administer on the behalf of the Liberian government, it was also granted unrestricted oversight on Liberia's finances giving Firestone unchecked economic and political power over Liberia for the next 20 years. And of course, this piece the nationalistic Americos. Faulkner would travel to the US to make sure everybody knew what had happened. At first, the Americans could care less what happened in Little West Africa, Liberia. That's until he met with State Department officials. The election was stolen from me! Sure, but... He used unconstitutional votes. Ah, sorry, buddy. Well, his government is engaged in trading slaves. <laughs> he what now? While Liberia enjoyed a brief period of prosperity during World War I, the Liberian Frontier Force, which had been a band of thugs, had developed into a well-trained and somewhat sophisticated army, which allowed Morova to exert more control over the interlands, its resources, and eventually the natives that lived on it, making Liberia's major export be labor by the end of the 20th century. For being used to conquer the Congo by the devil himself, to working as seamen for various navies around the world, Liberia's native labor had become a commodity for the American labor contractors to sell. The Liberian government in 1903, had passed legislation to regulate this trade, as it to use native labor to carry out all sorts of public works. Contractors were to pay a $250 licensing fee and a $5 tax on each laborer shipped. Also, just in case they did not make it back alive, a $150 bond was paid to the government to look the other way. But what Faulkner was accusing King's government of doing wasn't about someone sending some people to work and then returning home some few months later. No. He was accusing them of the hell known as the Fernando Po slave ring. The condition which the Liberian natives were subjected to was nothing but hellish. They woke up very early in the morning, ate dry yam and fish, and walked the sunset with little or no breaks. Some endured beatings and punishment that often led to death, and when the day was over, they were marched over crowded barracks to spend the night. Most natives who came to the highland never made it back home, and those who did, often died shortly. The US didn't really care about the conditions to which the natives were subjected to. It's the 1920s we're talking about here. What the US really cared about was how thousands of Liberian natives wandered up on a Spanish colonial highland. The US requested a special League of Nations inquiry into the treatments of natives in Liberia. It took six months to collect and gather all the information it needed, traveling throughout the interlands and visiting every settlement they could reach. The same tales of humiliation, intimidation, extortion, and brutality repeated itself throughout the interland. But none was as bad or as brutal as the reports that came out of Maryland. Before becoming King's running mate in the 1927 presidential election, Alan Yancey was the governor of Maryland County. He ran the surrounding interlands as his personal chiefdom, ruthlessly extracting as much value as he could from the native population from conscripting natives to building private farms, along with Southern American-style plantation mansions to go with them, Yancey's exploitation knew no bounds. Cruelty evolved into brutality and extortion. Not only was he involved in the shipping of natives to Fernando Poe, 
He used the Liberian frontier force to conduct what would only be described as slave raids. He demanded native ships to pay their debts of taxes in men, all of whom would end up being shipped to Fernanda Po. And for villages that did not meet his demand, well, they were burnt to the ground. The report of the investigation shook the American society to its core. Many could not believe the atrocities committed by their fellow countrymen. The shame and guilt led to an instant backlash against King's government, which immediately banned the trade of laborers. Many unsatisfied demanded that King and Nancy resign and face criminal trials. King resigned and went on to work for Firestone, where he was able to redeem his image towards the end of his life. Yancey on the other hand tried to repair his reputation after resigning, but the scorn and rejection he faced made him to exile himself to Nigeria, where he lived disgraced until his death. Internationally, the inquiry damaged US Liberian relationship, which took Liberia decades to repair, but in reality nothing really came out of the inquiry. As I mentioned before, this was the 1920s. Almost all member states of the League of Nations were guilty of what Liberia did, which stopped short of being considered slavery, a definition the UN still uses today. The 1950s and 60s were a period of explosive economic growth for Liberia. The post-World War II world had an insatiable hunger for two of Liberia's most abundant resources, iron for rebuilding bridges and erecting new skyscrapers and rubber, which was a necessary component for the new cars to drive to these new buildings. This made Liberia the second fastest green economy in the world. This was a good time for Liberia, as it was flooded with foreign investment. The government's budget grew from $1 million to over $40 million. Liberia was finally able to modernize its infrastructure into the new age, and with its debt paid off, the Americas could once again feel a sense of pride as this was the era of William V. S. Tuckman, the 19th and longest serving president of Liberia. Tuckman's route to the presidency was a very difficult one, being the cousin to the disgraced former vice president Yancey and the political son of King, he had an Napoleon tax in front of him. But his open door policy towards foreign investment proved to be a game changer for Liberia, as the new investment helped raise the standard of living in the country. New schools, roads, and government buildings were built all over Morovia, including a brand new $28 million presidential palace called the Executive Mansion. It had its own power plant, water supply, and sewage system, and included a secret atomic bomb shelter, just in case anybody had any bright ideas. Hmm? For the Americos, they enjoyed a level of luxury that was unparalleled in the country's history. They were the country's first true wealthy elites. As they finally had the money to match their taste, they lived in the finest air conditioned homes, drove the best American cars, and shopped for the best goods from all around the world in their local department stores. This lifestyle led to Liberia being dubbed the Switzerland of Africa. Tubman made concerted efforts to mend the strained relationship between the Americas and the natives. He signed the Unification Act of 1964, which allowed 98% of the country's population to finally become citizens. The interlands were restructured into counties and allowed to vote in their leaders. But like all American presidents before, Tubman made sure to keep the natives out of national politics for as long as he could. New schools, roads, and clinics were built in the new counties, with promising natives giving scholarships to study in the US. During this period, some Americans began adopting native children and giving them their surnames, which opened up many opportunities for them in American society. Now let's talk about the juicy stuff. Of course, Tubman did not remain president for life simply because librarians loved him unconditionally. This was merely the image he tried to project. The truth is that Tubman has stifled the political space in Liberia. He ran a complex Orwellian police state, complete with a public relations department, whose job was to make sure that Tubman's image remained positive. At least that's what they tried to do till they resorted to intimidation, beatings, abductions, and forced disappearance, with some election rigging sprinkled here and there. What was left in Liberia was a political atmosphere where politicians vied from favors from Tubman. I'm not talking about your run of the mill kickbacks here and there. No, 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 no. This is Tubman, the real African big man. 
local governments went to outrageous lengths to outdo each other. Workers' wages were sometimes withheld to contribute towards top man's birthday gifts. From a Chrysler from Bassa County in 1960, a yacht from Maryland County in 1961, to an aeroplane from Sino County in 1962. Like all dictators, I mean um, presidents for life, Tobman grew increasingly paranoid about losing power and kept finding enemies that did not exist. He was particularly scared of communists from having the Liberian ambassador to Kenya tried for treason simply because he had a pin that was a gift for Mao Zedong. To waiting on Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana, who he feared could summon influence and corrupt the natives, especially the striking rubber workers who were asking for better pay and working conditions. He believed they were all Soviet spies and sent them to Bela Yela, Liberia's jungle, Gulag. Although Dogman's policies brought significant investment to Liberia, it didn't really translate into equal economic opportunities for all the citizens. While the Americans strived under his rule, non americans and natives struggled with poverty and limited access to quality education and healthcare. Maybe it would really take a revolution for them to see any change in their fortunes. Dobman would pass away in 1971 after a botched surgery, leaving most Liberians with a freedom they have never experienced before. Few were as lucky as Joseph Samson Chesson, the abductive son of the Attorney General to the new and 18th President of Liberia, William Tupert. Being part of the children of Topman, a generation that was lucky enough to enjoy scholarships from Topman's administration to study abroad, Chesson's fate was destined to be one of luxury. Shortly after returning from the US with a law degree, he became a senator in 1977 and things were looking up for him. But fate had other plans as he was impeached by the Senate president for not kneeling down during a prayer session. This made him resentful of American society. Falling out with his foster father for not standing up for him, he soon dropped his chest's name for his native one, Chia Chipo. By the late 80s, the children of Tubman began returning to Liberia. Most of them went to American colleges, where they were radicalized by the political movements of the era. From the civil rights movements to women's liberation and the anti-war protests, they had become hungry for change. Especially the natives who returned to find that American society bore too much resemblance to the repressive structures in the US. They soon discovered that there were no jobs for them in Liberia, as other industries were neglected and not developed. The dreams old Uncle Shad sold to them were all lies. Unlike his predecessor, Tobert knew that Liberia had to change for the educated natives and settler youths. The repressive political environment created by Tubman could no longer exist in Liberia. He wanted to show the world, but especially the natives, that Liberia was theirs. He disbanded the secret police and public relations department and forged stronger ties with the Soviet Union and China to signal a real departure from Tubman's past. Tubber's reform ushered in an era of political freedom and inspired the formation of groups such as the Movement of Justice in Africa. Moja was a non-violent reformist organization that believed that adopting African communal traditions and progressive thoughts was going to bring about real change in Liberia. They spread their messages through programs like the Barak Union, which offered literacy and political education to native members of the Liberian army. Other groups like the Progressive Alliance of Liberia called for a more radical change, arguing that the system itself needed to be dismantled in order to achieve true progress. As the global economy began to slow down in the 1970s, the demand for iron and rubber declined, and with no other industry to support Liberia's economy, it went in a downward spiral. Prices of commodities began to rise. As the government tried to fight inflation through price fixing and ceilings, it did not stop the disastrous consequences on the living conditions of the poor masses. By 1979, the government, in order to avoid bankruptcy, removed subsidies on a number of imports including the all-important rice. On the 14th of April 1979, 2,000 protesters gathered around the office of the PAL to protest the government's removal of subsidies on rice. After much negotiation with the government and Moja, they were able to convince the PAL to disband the crowd which had already gone out of control. Security forces had stormed the PAL's office, which led to protesters marching on the executive mansion. 
The frustration and tension just needed a catalyst to ignite the hell that was about to break out. It only really took one push from a police officer. What followed was three days of riot and looting, which took 700 troops from neighboring Guinea to suppress the rioting, as Tobet did not trust the Liberian soldiers to shoot their own countrymen. Matthews, the leader of the PAL, Chia Chipo, and other leaders of the PAL, Moja, and other organizations were quickly rounded up and thrown into jail. They were released a few weeks later after being brutalized and humiliated to give an apology on national TV and promised to distance themselves from challenging the government ever again. Liberia's next general election was slated for June 1980, and with the hosting of the OAU summit which went on successfully, Tobet was sure to win his re-election. That was if he could get past the PAL, which had transformed into a political party called the Progressive People's Party. It was going to be a showdown between the old guards and the newcomers. Tobet and Matthews could be seen in debates, TV programs and interviews, one arguing that Liberia had changed, while the other insisted that the true party had to go. But old habits have a really hard time dying. The PPP was harassed constantly. Party meetings were disrupted and members were arrested for flimsy reasons. The PPP responded the only way it knew how to. Midnight rallies were held to denounce the persecution of its party members. But on the 7th of March, Matthew led the crowd on the executive mansion to demand for Tobet's resignation. This time, the PPP and Moja leaders were arrested for sedition and treason. With the trial date set for the 14th of April, it seemed like this chapter for change for the natives, like all others that came in the past, was coming to an end. Perhaps they acted with an urge to save their teachers, who were rumored to be executed, or save their skins because Tobet was lashing out against anyone who was perceived to be sympathetic to the radicals. We would never know why they truly did it. But on a moonless night on the 12th of April 1980, 15 low-ranking officers of the Liberian Army, armed with only two rifles, invaded the executive mansion. They managed to overpower the heavily armed guards and made it all the way to the 8th floor, where they assassinated the president. Gone forever are the days of who you know. And do you know who I am? Well, we now enter the time of what can you do? This is the people's thing. Our people's thing. Long live the People's Redemption Council. Long live the Republic of Liberia. It took only an hour to end 133 years of True Week Party's reign in Liberia, and even less to release Matthews, Chia Chipo, and other dissidents from prison. The celebrations and chants of the name Samuel Doe, the highest ranking native officer and leader of the PRC, could be heard throughout the streets of Monrovia, as many of them hoped this marked a new dawn for natives in Liberia. Those swiftly replaced all the Americans in government position with the radicals. The era of American supremacy in Liberia was over, as many fled the country to the US. Members of the former government were arrested and tried in kangaroo courts for corruption, treason, human rights violation, and anything the PRC could think of. Some of them were spared like the Minister of Finance and future President Ellen John C. Selif. But many were not so lucky as they were tortured, humiliated, and dragged through the streets of Moravia, then tied to telephone poles on the beach, and executed. The government that formed after the coup was meant to be a temporary one. Comprised of the PRC and the radicals of the PPP and Moja, they had the intention to make the country more fairer for everyone and restore Liberia into a prospering nation. For the radicals, this meant drawing up a new constitution, passing land reforms to return farming lands to the natives, and revamping the school curriculum to be more Afrocentric amongst other things. But Samuel Doe had a different vision, as restoring Liberia did not lie in the future, but in the past with his idol, William Tubman, who he imitated down to the smallest detail. Doe sought to become the new Tubman, reintroducing the excessive birthday gifting and slowly re-establishing the oppressive structures that were once used to snuff out political freedom. The radicals began to resign from their positions as they butted heads with the PRC, which had grown corrupt and incredibly incompetent, as the US under Ronald Reagan's administration spoiled those still with military and foreign aid. In return, the CIA was allowed to operate freely from Liberia. Doe, I, I mean Dr. Doe, ever so becoming like his mentor had no intention of leaving office, running for the presidency in 1985. And when he was expectedly losing at the polls, he had the ballot seized and declared himself the winner with 50.9% of the vote. 
See, King, this is how you rig an election. After a failed co attempt, Do became paranoid and isolated and unleashed a reign of repression, terror, and suffering, with massacres committed on the Gao Amano tribes for the next four years. Do's antics were making Liberia become unstable, as armed factions began to form along tribal lines, with the Gao and the Manu coming together to form the National Patriotic Front of Liberia under the leadership of Charles Taylor the half-gal, half-american American schooled warlord. The MPFL quickly overran the countryside, kicking off the first Liberian civil war. Within a year, the countryside was overrun by gangs and local warlords, as a weak Liberian army withdrew to the capital, with Do refusing to surrender and not wanting Liberia to become a playground for Libya, which backed the NPFL campaigns. Nigeria along with Ekumar came to Do's aid, reassuring him of safe passage to Nigeria or the US. But on September 9, 1990, Do was ambushed and fell into the hands of the warlord, Prince Johnson who proceeded to mutilate Do on live TV, dragging his dead body through the streets of the capital. What followed next was six years of the most deplorable conditions you cannot even imagine, from drugged up child soldiers to old men being forced to dig their graves, and what I can only describe as burying a gender reveal parties with a bit of gambling involved. By 1996, all sides had grown tired of the drawn out conflict, as there was no clear victor. After numerous peace conferences, they agreed to lay down their weapons on the condition they would be allowed to appear in the polls of the forthcoming elections. During the campaign trail, Taylor in a metaphoric sense had a gun to the country's head, as he threatened to restart the war if he was not elected president. Crowds chanted in horn, with smiles that had a ting of sadness to them. He killed my mom, he killed my father, I'm gonna vote for him. Taylor's government was just what you had expected from a former warlord. Incompetence, corruption and repression once all what Liberians had to deal with. As Taylor's cronies terrorized and stole from the helpless civilians with impunity. But Taylor wanted more than what Liberia could give him. He wanted the diamonds in Syria alone. He funded and provided training to the revolutionary United Front, who unleashed the reign of terror, forcing many to the mines and giving the diamonds to Taylor, who laundered them in the international markets. As the years went by, just like the old presidents before him, Taylor became paranoid and isolated. And I think you know what happens next. The second Liberian war lasted up to 2003. It was just as bloody as the first one. Only this time, Taylor was all alone, funding his war by aggravating the blood diamond trade in Syria alone, to which charges of international war crimes were brought against him. In the final days of the war, as rebel forces were closing in on the capital, Nigeria once again offered Taylor safe passage, which he took, resigning and fleeing to Calabar, Nigeria, where he lived he was extradited to face his war crimes in 2006. In the years after Taylor was exiled, the country went through a period of reconciliation to heal the scars that ran deep across every fabric of society. The continuous conflict that lasted 15 years had left Liberia a broken country. The tax of healing and rebuilding seemed an impossible feat. They had to consider what it meant to stand together as a community once again, beginning the slow and painful process of rebuilding and creating a more peaceful future for Liberia. The high young lady, Ellen Johnson Selef, became president in 2006, bringing in much needed economic competence to Liberia as the economy, but more importantly, the society began to recover. She handed power over in 2018 to former football legend George Welch. In the sands of Liberia's untamed shores, the echoes of those who journey from America to the windward coast resonate with an unquenchable test for something more. Hey guys, thanks for watching the video to the very end. I'm very, very grateful. If you enjoyed the video, please like, share and subscribe. You can also leave a comment on anything you want me to see. I also want to say a big thank you to the following people. Liu, whose voice could be heard throughout the video, you know, from Hashmon to the BOI agents. Victory, the creator, where voice Marcus Gavi. And Jupiter, who I also want to appreciate for his contributions to the video. You can find the link to their YouTube channels and profiles in the description below. Also, a big shout out to my patrons for supporting this project. You guys are a big pillar to this channel and I'm really, really grateful for that. 
If you would like to have exclusive updates and behind the scenes stuff with your name at the end of every video we release, please consider being a patron of the channel. Till next time, I'm Bamiche. Bye.